Hello and welcome to SFI Not So Live with me, Jay Evans, your host. It's September 2023 and as usual, I've got a cracking panel of people that we're going to be talking to you about the mortgage and property markets in the UK. Quick caveat, we're recording this on the 25th of August 2023, so some of the things we discuss, especially as we're going to be discussing rates, may be um, subject to change. So before I waffle on any more, I think let's go around the room and say uh, do some introductions, say hello to the panel. So first one on my screen, Tony. Tony, welcome. A little introduction for the audience, please. I'm sure they know who you are already. <laughs> so, sorry for them. Uh, morning, Jay. Uh, my name is Tony Hall. I'm head of business development here at Saffron for Intermediaries. And my role is basically ensuring that um, our brokers get everything they want and need from us to help their complex and specialist clients. Brilliant stuff. And uh, Tony's colleague and uh, and a regular uh, on the podcast, Phil, good morning. A quick introduction from you, please. Good morning, Jay. Yeah, I'm Phil Lawford, the National Account Manager at Saffron for Intermediaries, uh, and I look after all our, our mortgage intermediary partners. There we go. And special guest for this month, uh, again, not someone brand new, but someone we haven't had with us for a little while. Welcome back. Anna, Anna, quick introduction for us, please, for the audience. Hi, I'm a reporter at Mortgage Solutions and assistant editor for Specialist Learning Solutions. So I basically try my best to cover the weird and wonderful world of mortgages and specialist lending, um, which has been very interesting over the past couple of years, not even just the past, but especially over the past few months. I think you're going to bring a certain amount of knowledge to us a little bit during this. So thanks for joining us, Alice. Really appreciate it. Uh, just a reminder, just a reminder that some of the things we discussed today, the opinions will be our personal opinions as opposed to that of our employers on what we've read and what we see. We'll be pulling apart some of the latest news stories um, with a little bit of a slant on this month in that we're going to be featuring quite a bit on buy to let, and that will all become apparent as we go through the podcast. Um, but we're not starting off with buy to let. We're starting off with a story from Anna's publication from mortgage solutions and uh, <coughs> excuse me and this is according to right move lenders are pricing competitively and we're seeing mortgage rates uh, continuing to fall now um it seems to be slightly more towards five years as opposed to two year um it's good news for borrowers surely tony but with the base rates still going up how's how are we doing this well you know we're seeing rates drop with the base rates going up explain that a little bit to the broker for us um I think it's probably a couple of factors. One is if you look at um, the swap rate position, which is generally where that di that drives the fixed rate environment, um, because that's how lenders are, uh, are getting their money. Those those have plateaued a bit and have dropped slightly. So um, you can see that the money markets are, uh, are building in this this almost slow period or benign period. So rates are aren't rising on that. Um, but they're probably not dropping as fast as the um, interest rates in the market are. And I think from my perspective, that's down to a volume play for lenders. So we've had a period of rising rates where everybody has uh, not been doing a lot of lending. And as we come into September, it's the rush to fill the box for the rest of 2023, as well as starting our planning for 2024. So getting a good head start into our pipeline because because you know, from from offer on a house to completion is up to five months. Um, we need to start building our pipelines for 2024 now. So that's, in my view, where this this um, kind of rate drop is coming from. It's about getting volume. Largely, the lenders doing the dropping is the volume players that need that heavy volume to come through. More, more specialist or building society lenders like ourselves aren't necessarily quite as... Um, tucked into this volume play because it's not about that for us. So it's not quite the same. But I think that's the reason why you're seeing it. And obviously they are talking about another rate rise because um, that's the only instrument they have. They have nothing else. So either up or down or do nothing. That, that's not really much of a choice. But um, And that's why that doesn't kind of match the rest of the market. Anna, I'm going to come to you um, as a, an industry journalist just to see if you've seen anything in the way of trends. I mean, I've read multiple stories of people saying rates are dropping, rates are dropping, but I haven't really looked at if it's a specific market or a specific customer. Anything you've seen there? Anything yeah. sort of nuances in there you can give us? 
so I'd say the nuances of it are it's, it does um, like Tony said does tend to be like the bigger uh, high street lenders. So I think this week it's been HSBC, Nationwide, Virgin Money, and Santander have they've all cut their rates. And I think with them it's also like if one of them cuts their rates, it kind of means that the other bigger lenders have to do something to their rates because it kind of creates this kind of cascading effect where then this person was at the top of the pile and then they reduce their rates and then the other person's at the top. And so it kind of cascades down a little bit. Um, and I think there's also, I think what I've noticed has also been quite a lot of criteria changes. So people that can't necessarily, I say people like lenders that can't, might not necessarily compete on rates. They'll change their criteria. They'll kind of tweak their affordability or they'll, you know, I think there's been some guys, I think Atom Bank kind of increased their maximum loan sizes for certain products uh, up certain income multiples and some other things so and that's another way that lenders are trying to kind of fill that bucket like and um i think yeah so some rate ch changes have been a lot bigger but i have noticed that the rate changes are getting smaller so i think nationwide earlier this week it was like down by 0.4 percent was like the biggest rate decrease and i think tsb today was something like 0.1 percent which isn't really a lot but it's kind of but yeah it is kind of trending downwards but i think some people are being more aggressive than others it's interesting because phil one of the things i did notice so i, just, I asked Anna about trends what mm -hmm. did you notice and we're going to start talking about buy to let in a minute was quite a lot of stories about buy to let rates dropping now that i think that's a signal here that there's some some efforts to stimulate that market mm -hmm. uh which is why we're kind of focusing a little bit on buy to let and, and michael goh's been out in the media again you always know if he's out something's going on um i know so, i'm gonna have a busy uh, day if he's done the rounds on the, on yeah, the I was gonna say he's done the rounds on the <laughs> 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 i'm not all sure of the best stories either but anyway uh, my question to you phil was do you think the drop in buy to let rates is to stimulate the market and to to bring to give landlords some kind of incentive and we're going to go on to more serious aspects of this but let's look at it just from a rates perspective now yeah i think partially uh i mean buy to let rates are normally slightly higher than residential anyway so perhaps there's some there was some m movement there but but yeah uh it, it's been exceedingly difficult as we're going to probably talk about in the next topics for uh buy to let lenders and landlords because of um it's all about the higher the rates the higher the rental yield re re requirement so that's why we've had uh, there's been a lot of de robust debate in the industry about um lower rate products with very high fees but i have sympathy for lenders doing that because of that what that's the, the only way they could get the the rental uh, yields and, and the, the rental coverages to fit the calculations because it's normally got to be a percentage over over either over the pay rate or at a higher stress test rate so um so, so yeah I, I, th I think part of that is is, is um that stimulation piece but i think as, as a wider bit uh a bit of confidence has returned to the market as well because of last month uh, in, we, we, obviously, we, we, we've had inflation perform slightly better than expected. Um, and the Bank of England will, uh, have adjusted the base rate as we expected them to. So swap rates have, have, have obviously then performed or, 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 or been lower as, as a result of that. So the confidence there has, has, has certainly really helped. Uh, so I think we, we're all just hoping that inflation continues to to reduce, and, and let's hope there's no unexpected nasty surprises in in in, in, in the second half of the year. Um, I think half year one has been very much refinance based, and that's what's held the market up. Um, I think half year two will be perhaps more difficult, which is probably also why lenders are reducing rates because of the market is is probably going to be slightly harder. Uh, I still think the Bank of England have got it wrong by increasing rates or expecting rates to increase. I think it's wrong. I think they've got to let what they've already done sort of unravel and play out. But they seem hell bent on 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 carrying on raise increasing the rate which okay, i think then, is wrong but that's all of you are we going to get another 0.25 percent increase at the next time 
I, th I think it's yeah. nailed on. Yeah. Yeah, I think yeah. there's a story that we there's a story that we put up yesterday. I think and it's like another two base rate hikes expected by the end of the year seems to be the expectation, um, which is not not very. It's I'm just like oh no, <laughs> but you know, it's it, as as I can't remember who said it now, but it seems to be a new mechanism they've got at the moment. Yeah. I think it was you talking. Well, yeah, it, it's all they seem yeah, to be playing it, with. It's all they got. They got what? Well, they've got nothing else. That's the only thing, you know. And we've got spiraling wage rises. You know, to to fight spiraling costs, so people are getting more money to then spend more money, and there's no, they haven't got any other measure. So, you know, the, the only thing I, I I would pick up on is like we're talking about high wage increases, but I'd really like to see a breakdown of that because of I think it's probably more at the top end. I've, it's probably I've, a, Bill, uh, I've got a link to send you. I read a story a couple of yeah, days ago. I've got a link to send you. I'm, my jaw hit the floor when I realised. Yeah, a lot of people are struggling, you know, particularly at the middle and the lower end. Um, and, yeah, it's not – I just don't think it's helping anybody at the moment. Everybody's squeezed and can't be squeezed anymore. If um, if you've seen the story, said, Phil, I know uh, similar, to, similar to you and I, Similar to you and I, um, and our opinions before, it was very much the top percentile that is uh, mm. seeing the increase, and it's a lot of CEOs. Uh, so as I said at the start of the podcast, we, we are going to look a bit deeper into the buy-select market. Um, so I'm going to move on to a story I found, oh, we all, I think we've all seen in the Independent that caught our eye. I think, Tony, you were the one that originally pushed me to this, which was that rent is now cheaper than mortgage payments for the first time since 2010. Um, bit of a caveat on that. Obviously, if you're looking at London and some of the big cities, that's not going to be the case. So if you live in London or Brighton or the South Coast, you, this isn't for you. It is very much about um, the North and Scotland, I presume. But it is a milestone of, of you know, the rents being cheaper. Now, um, what does this mean, Tony? What does this mean for, for first time buyers? Do you think they're going to sit for a little while longer? Do you think it's going to be like they're going to look at this and think, oh, I've got a little while longer, maybe I'll save for more because actually I'm going to be saving? Or do you think it's just one of those things where it's going to readjust at a later date anyway, that they'll just it'll just carry on as they are? Yeah, look, no, it's, gosh, who knows? I mean, one, it's no surprise, is it? You know, if the price, if the cost of borrowing money has gone up, yeah, then funnily enough, um, the, 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 landlord has to recoup the cost of that borrowing into a just breaking even but also making money otherwise what's the point um, particularly as you've got the so say reduction in house prices against that so their only true return at the moment is their yield um, it's kind of it is what it is so for first time buyers it's tough because the money that they were hoping to put in their deposit is now going to fund the rent which means they might be another year or two down the line before they can buy. Um, but, you know, there are lots of um, schemes and lenders out there that can help those first-time buyers who are a little bit um, strapped for that. Um, funny enough, Saffron are one of them. Just thought I'd get that in there. Um, so it is... Um, it'll all balance it out, won't it? But again, it, it, it's a great, you know, it's a great headline, but it's like, it's not rocket science is it the cost of funding goes up therefore the cost of renting will at some point naturally go up as well um i think you know uh, yeah so i'll let the others come in with their view but that's kind of kind of mine i i, I like, took that view of yeah. it's a lag isn't it it's a lag of catch up you know the, the rent, yeah. rent's, rent's going to go up the rents are going to follow so just how, how many months is it going to be before actually the rent is going to look and go no my rent's gone up now so I, I agree with you anna any comments on that so i'll come to you next uh, so i think it, with the rents outstripping mortgages i think it's it's not just because of rising kind of cost of the buy to let mortgage because i think it's a, some i think like um it's something like there's 2 million buy to let mortgages but there's about 5.5 .5 million properties in the private rental sector so really only about 37 percent of those properties have a buy set mortgage but costs are going up across the board it's the cost of maintenance you know upcoming epc yeah. regulation all this other kind of stuff so it's not yeah. i wouldn't say it's surprising in the sense of that the mortgages are just a part of a part of that kind of rising rental picture um but i do yeah i think it's it's not unexpected and it probably is going to kind of maybe remain like that until mortgage rates start to tick to kind of go down but that will take a couple of years and i don't think we'd ever get back to that kind of sub one percent madness that we saw a couple of years ago so it's a yeah it's an interesting one phil 
you're going to love what I'm about to ask you. This is a topic you and I love to talk about because <laughs> we know why this. We know why rents are high anyway because there isn't enough housing in in the rental market. Let's face it, and yeah, you know, buy sell landlords are doing really well because they they are buying up to rent out because there is no social housing. There's a lack of rental housing. So obviously, this is a short term thing, but the the ultimate goal here is really from any from any government should be to build more to allow the rental market to to expand and then perhaps there's an opportunity to get rents down lower so we're not relying on the buy slate market but that's a controversial subject but it's something we've always always discussed you know the the rents will continue to rise because the mortgages are rising you know it's it's short term right yeah yeah i think it is i mean i think one thing I suppose my, my main, I suppose, observation or, or comment on this article is it it does demonstrate how how important a component of the housing market uh, the private rental sector is. It, it's it's just you know it's picked up the slack where where mm. there's been an absence of social housing, um, you know whether uh, whether that's you know affordable housing or, or just sort of social social rent and social landlords were in that absence the private rental sector whether you like it or not it has picked that it has picked that slack up and, and serves a really valuable segment of the, of the market and you know uh i think people's circumstances have changed as well and and, and it, it's oh, yeah in the rest of europe uh you know it, first time buyers are, have always bought later uh so so i think it, it sort of correlates with with that as well but uh i can't really add any more other than i, I just think you know it, it does highlight how important the um the private rental sector is now and we can't ignore it and it's it's it's, it's like an ecosystem we you've got to have that balance haven't you, you you've got to we're, we're probably you know uh we, we, last month we talked about the um the rental reform bill uh, and and it, it, it's so important to get the balance right so landlords are treated fairly but at the same time tenants are as well and it, it's, it's striking that balance of, of fairness i forget what month it is tony we did one we did a buy to let conversation was it was it with jane jane simpson potentially i can't remember yeah that. and actually In how June, landlords think, are yeah. so much more professional now than the yeah. hobby landlords of the past as it were and as phil was just mm. saying they have stepped up and they are professional. We've got a lot more limited company landlords out there with good portfolios who do really good work. It's not their fault that costs are rising and that materials are rising and actually doing any you know, maintenance work on buildings, as Anna was saying earlier. It's not their fault those costs have risen. But actually, as, as Phil just said, I mean, we could sit here and slate the fact that there are so many private landlords out there, but actually they are so much better than they've ever been. And I think, you know, should, we should be giving them the credit, shouldn't we? Well, yeah. yeah if, exactly. I mean, if you took those five point five million private rented properties out of the sector, then how you know how many people would be homeless or wouldn't have access to social housing? Like it is crucial, but it does need. And you know, there are the landlords are much more professional, but they do there does need to be proper reform because it's not really yeah. working as well as it could do. And that I mean that goes across the housing sector Agreed. to be honest. But it's you know I think the renters reform bill is still only on its second reading. Because obviously the, yeah. um, we went on parliamentary recess, and there's still another ten stages to go before it even but gets, you know, gets royal assent and becomes law. So that's still a long way. Didn't they say? Anna, I'm sure they said that that could even be after the next general election if they if they hold the general election in May. We look, we're looking at a potential net, another government to pick it up. So yeah, and it could go on for a lot longer. Yeah, and then you could also have the thing of it being completely changed. I know Michael Gove said he wanted to make certain measures stronger, maybe weaken some other things. But then if you have a Labour government coming in, then they might have different ideas and then you're almost back to square one again. And so it's just kind of leaving a lot of people in limbo. Mm. Well, we've we've stuff, just I know. loved you. We have very much just queued up the next topic because this leads beautifully into what I was going to ask on the next one because the next topic is that private landlords are twice as likely to sell properties at the moment than they are to purchase them. Now, we could look at this. Phil, I'm going to come to you first because I never come to you first. I come to you first. Um, but it does it does really indicate that these reforms and the things that are coming in and you know, the, the condition on the EPC ranks, they are a little bit scary for landlords with rising costs. And they're thinking, actually, can I afford to have a portfolio of the same size or do I need to offload? So 
Um, and it, and it, and as Andrew just said, it'd be a disaster if these properties come off. They're bought up by by family. Who's got? Where's the rental properties for the people that need them? We've already got a shortage. It's going to be a disaster. So, you know, this is quite scary, isn't it? That they're more likely to sell up. It is. It is. But having said all that, uh, I've still seen the buy to let market still holding up despite all the challenges. Uh, I mean. We at Saffron, I know we're only a very small player in the buy-to-let market in the grand scheme of things, but we are still seeing demand for our buy-to-let products. Uh, and if we if we don't have a full buy-to-let portfolio of products out, we're constantly asked by intermediaries, when will you have them out? Uh, so demand, we're still seeing demand hold up. And... Um, there was an article this morning from Money Age, uh, which stated that the UK remains a top destination for international property investors. So, um, you, our, our property market is, is is still seen as 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 good value for for money, probably in terms of capital appreciation in UK property, mm-hmm. uh, and I I, I, I think. Landlords, the, the, I think smaller landlords probably feel it more. Uh, that was going to be my next question. Are we, do you, you think this is swayed more yeah. to a smaller landlord as opposed to our limited company or our, our real pro? I landlord? think so. I think the more professional landlords, we're seeing change in properties as well. So we are seeing uh, trends for landlords picking up more new build properties because there's less um, EPC um and, and changes to properties they need to do so you've probably seen some offloading of some more older less energy efficient properties and we're also seeing some movement to landlords either converting or wanting to to uh switch to hmos as well where they're getting better rental yields as well so we're seeing changes in behavior as well but i'm still relatively optimistic that although we are seeing changes and some attrition, I still think it's holding up. Anna, just you on this, because you get access to a lot more than we do. And mm-hmm. it's, Phil, just, I, Phil just alluded to, you see one story mm-hmm. of saying this, and it'll be a flip yeah. of the story in a, another publication. So from your perspective and looking at the market, I, I, what's your opinion? Do you, do you see the difference between those stories? Do you see different yeah. different research coming out? Is this so it is, it is, it is, um, you know, you could have two two press releases on the same day, one being like, oh, half of landlords looking to buy and the other one saying, oh, half of landlords looking to sell. So it is, it can be quite challenging to kind of actually figure out exactly what's going on. But I would say it seems to be that it's changing. It's not like, you know, you do see headlines like buy to let is dead. And, you know, it's all like it makes this like it's on fire and it's, you know, everything is, you know, going, going to going down the pan. But it's kind of, but actually, I think it is what Phil said of just kind of actually that some of the smaller landlords might be looking to sell up. Bigger landlords are kind of like reconsidering their options. It is a bit brokers I speak to, it is a bit more challenging to place certain buy to let deals because the rates are higher and because of that ICR and, you know, it is a bit more challenging to kind of get the deal that they want. But, you know, lenders are still in the buy to let space. They can still get them placed. It's just probably taking them longer than it would have done before. So I think it is just more of a complex and nuanced picture. But I think it is it's not as, you know, there's some kind of complexity in there that's kind of hidden by some of the headlines that you see. Tony, just over to you on um this again i think you've pretty much got the same opinions as the others you're nodding away but do you want to add to that and do you think there's anything that can be done to encourage landlords to stay in because i think you know we've, we've talked a lot about the rent reform bill we've talked about the, all these different legislation things that are changing i'll just pause there um so you know do you think there's anything that the government could do to kind of reassure landlords um Interesting one. Interesting one. I, I don't know. I'm not, not, well, I mean, obviously we've seen the articles or we've been looking through about, you know, proposals to actually look, let's give them a break. Let's cut out some of the tax things. Let's not make it so difficult to be a landlord and have the cost of that. So I think there is, is more that could be done, but just to, to echo, you know, Phil and Anna, look, there's still a market there. Phil's quite right. We, we, whenever we have our products out there, we we get business you know and interestingly one of the things we're getting asked at the moment is regulated buy to lets 
that's a very very common one so slightly different because obviously they are treated as as though it's a they're treated as though it's a residential because you do it on affordability, not on rental yield. But you can see that's a change of people now moving out of a property and, and renting it to family. That's obviously how the regulator comes from. So you can see how that's maybe changing. Um, but it's, it's, it's kind of everything they've said. I'm kind of agreeing that, look, people are selling houses – I think he was. I think it's Roger Morris at, at, uh, from Tandem Bank, who's a who's a portfolio analyst in his own right, has been explaining with his portfolio, which is very northeast based, that unless your house, unless the value of the property is one hundred and sixty thousand or more, there's very little commercial benefit in retrofitting it to deliver an EPC rating of of, of C that's required. So for a lot of landlords, it's actually, it's not the, what's, there's no point. There's no commercial value for me in holding on to this stock. So divest of it. And what they're doing is Phil said, which creates another problem is buying up new builds because there is no EPC mm. challenge with those because they have to be built with that. But that's creating the opportunity for first time buyers I suppose, to buy a property at a reasonable value, but then have the ongoing cost of having to retrofit it as though it was a new build. And then you have the ongoing challenge of a lot of this property is Victorian Edwardian mm. stock that is that doesn't lend itself to retrofitting because those houses are designed to breathe. And if you block them up with energy efficient windows and walls, they go moldy. And therefore, so it's a real challenge everywhere but i agree that landlords the business people go in uh, commercially i've got to do what's right for me but until, as you say until the um government sort out and go right we don't need that epc relax or there's rebates or something that can support development you're never going to solve this issue are you do you think though we have this conversation we talk about green quite a lot so let's pick up on this epc just for a minute it's, it's coming off topic slightly but with with EPC ratings, do you not think there's this perception that it's going to cost you hundreds of thousands of pounds? Where actually, there's some things even on these Victorian style houses you can do that perhaps aren't as costly, or are they? Are these houses so in, necess- in need of like so much of an upgrade that actually it will cost you that amount of money? Because some of, some of the sort of newer houses, perhaps like they fall down into an E or an F, you could probably get them up to a C, you know, without investing majorly huge amounts of money but as you were saying a first time buyer buying it and not having the necessary pressure on them and having years to do it what's the swings i mean is it is it a benefit that the, the landlords then offload these older houses and the first time buyers come in and think well i can spend the next five years doing well, that. I ain't got to worry about the place. yeah i mean it, it, it's a balance as to how long you want to keep the house and therefore how how much work you do because you either you either buy a house with it all up front and pay a premium for doing it Hmm. um or you buy a house without it at a lower premium and then have to do it isn't it so either way you're going to pay the same amount of money potentially so it's just when on the scale but as you say you think you're quite right there is this misnomer that a retrofitting house is going to be super expensive with all this stuff but actually you can make i think you can make marginal gains with very small incremental bits like you know 190 pounds for thermo blinds save you 300 pound a year off your heating cost yep. you know so there's loads loads you can do but you know going actually going back to the previous story about first time buyers just very quickly and the issues of renting one of the things the europeans are quite good at with their custom build is building collective custom build blocks of flats mm-hmm. so a group of buyers build together and build the flats together therefore you benefit from all the economies of scale of doing 10 or 15 units with one builder and you're all building in. So there's lots of things. If we could do that and our psyche was to do that culturally, as well as, you know, economic and government support um, to solve the issues. Ali, you were nodding away there. I'm going to come to you in case you want to say so, because you look like you're agreeing with a lot of what um, you should say. Well, I think it's like with the, um, with kind of retrofitting properties, I think there was something the government had said is like, oh, we don't want landlords to spend more than £10,000 retro, like retrofitting a property. So if it's going to cost you more than, you know, and that's kind of like buried in a report somewhere, so it might be out of date now. But it's also like until, so then do you, that kind of suggests that, oh, are they going to introduce some kind of grant or some kind of scheme so that, you know, actually, if it's above that, then you can get them, you know, you can get money back. 
would you want to make would you want to pay for stuff that you don't you should you might not have to pay for and then I do also think that with some you know with first time buyers you know the length of time first time buyers spend in a property has increased but if you're only going to be there for you know not it's not your forever home are you going to spend and even, could you even spend that much money kind of getting you know and it doesn't like we've said it doesn't have to be really expensive stuff but say if you did have the best thing you could do was doing loft insulation which is going to cost you a couple of grand and it's really disruptive you know are people really gonna are they gonna do that i don't know um so i think it's a, it's a tricky one i think there has to be some you know i think we got the there is more kind of informational resources out there which is which are good to kind of show you like oh so this is your current rating this is where we think you could go these are the changes you could make this is how much you could save which is good but it's um, but we also have a shortage of builders as well and you know especially with some of the retrofit ones that are trained to do like air source heat pumps and that kind of thing there's not many people who are trained to do that if you did do it and there's also an educational piece there where some people are just like i don't know how this works or i it's completely different so there's still a lot of work that needs to be done on that so phil i i have to agree with that or i think we we need some kind of scheme we need something for the government to say come on this is this is due and and so and and interestingly annie you picked up something that i was going to bring up later (laughs) In the only only this morning, I was reading a story about another um, batch, and when I say batch, I mean a huge batch of building companies that have gone into administration um, because of rising costs and, and lack of labour. So, okay. you know, we've got we've got houses that can't be built, <laughs> builders to build them. We've got the, the, the cost of materials is going up. So, you know, and, and we have the worst housing stock in in the Western world in in regard to, to energy efficiency. I mean, it's apart from that, it's all good. Yeah. It's all rosy and great. <laughs> We're all doomed. I mean, the other, can I just make a controversial point to what we've been talking about here, right? Because we've all talked through the lens of what it means to us or what it means to a borrower, as in cost. We haven't considered the whole green thing of actually, we're doing this for the -hmm. global us. And that's probably the most important thing. And at at which point does the balance between, I accept I actually probably have to spend more to save the planet rather mm. than save spend less to save my bills mm-hmm. we haven't talked about that so i thought i'd just bung that yeah. bit of controversy in i know so, it cues you up nicely phil because i know you love this subject but i yeah, yeah. Keep you nice. and i think you know tony's absolutely right we haven't said it and we've, we've, been, we've had a whole green podcast where we did nothing but talk about it um <laughs> so you know it's it, it is that balance isn't it it's about like are we going to spend a few extra quid it's not necessarily for us but actually there's also the other side of that tony you mentioned is the cost of living we've just been told that the base that you, the, the energy bills are staying and going up even though uh the cost is going down people are still being pinched like crazy so actually these small oh. investments on a long-term basis will save you a fortune so phil sorry i keep talking and i don't know you to answer no, I, I, yeah it's, 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 there's not there's not a lot i can can really add what's what's, what's been said to, to, to be quite honest yeah I, was, I, I can't i can't really uh add anything else to 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 uh to the, to the points you've, you've all made I think it, it's it's wishful thinking to think the government are going to come up with some kind of scheme. But as Anna said, maybe this this is buried down there in that report. Maybe let's mm. put our fingers crossed and hope they step yeah. in. I will also, yeah. well, let's I'd also, to that then. Oh, sorry. I was just going to... One quick thing. It's just, I suppose, the things that I've been hearing is that, you know, it is a really good opportunity for brokers to kind of build on their existing relationships with their customers just to kind of bring the broker yes. angle. It's just yes. like, look, if you can then follow yeah. up with your customers being like, oh, hey, I know that your EPC rating is, is a D you know, there is some simple like bridging solutions that we can get so that you could kind of get this done or there's these tools or there's this. And so there is a, you know, there is a kind of a positive side on that. that, And I think some oh. people, like there is that element of it as well. But it, uh, yeah. absolutely. Look, uh, sorry, Anna, I'll talk, Carl, no, carry on. I'd uh, I, I, I finished. So, <laughs> yeah, no, I was just saying, look, we as, as a at Saffron, we, we take we take this very, very seriously. And we've got, you know, we've got a whole project looking at green and not green for the sake of green washing but actually look how do we as a lender going back to what some i've always said is i don't want us to say we're we're, we're a green lender we're, we're a lender that just happens to be green as well you know everything we do is linked to that um we're not there yet but that is definitely our aspiration mm. and as, as soon as there's a ground swell of that it will it will happen won't it so um, and i think uh, just to just to plug our own podcast, but if you go back a few months and find the green special and, and have a listen, um, that was really addressed in that. We addressed the EPC range. We also addressed the 
the kind of the lack at the moment of a, a sort of consumer interest in green when it comes to finance because it's mm-hmm. still very new. It's still very it's not really ingrained in their thought process yet. And from a broker perspective, it's difficult for them to push them unless they've got the knowledge. And I think, you know, we, we, we're we really good. Some others are really good at really pushing it. But actually, how much are we educating the consumers and the brokers enough for them to give them the sellability of it? So, um, and I think, yeah, I mean, we could go on about this for another half an hour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've seen move on. Move on. Well, we're move on. Move on. Well, we'll stay with Bytelet. We'll move on to the other things in a minute. But I'm just going to pick on this intermediary story because um, this, it's related to the sale of of, of um, landlord homes. And this is saying that likely to sell up before their tenancy even ends. So now we've got a potential homelessness position of what's going on here. So, Tony, I've got a question for you. And I don't know the legality system, don't know what the deal is. So I'm going to ask you because I, I generally had a question. If I'm, if I'm, obviously I'm not, but if I'm renting a private house and my landlord sells from underneath me, can I sell it as a going concern? And what... How does that work? I.e., can another person get a mortgage on that house if the tenant stays in it? And what's the legality and what's the function of that? Or does that not exist? Yes, they can, actually. I mean, um, I'll I'll see Phil nodding or or grimacing at me with this answer. But look, actually, yeah, selling a house with a a tenant sitting in there is is great for a lender because it means I know you're going to get my mortgage paid because I've got, you know, going with a house without, um, with, with vacant, saying i'm gonna lend it i'm gonna rent it to somebody it's it's harder for us as a lender to go okay all right so yeah it's great but you know the risk is for that for that person as to what, what well i suppose that works from a buy to let buying it if another investor is buying it if it is a residential then it's a slightly different situation yeah but normally people wouldn't buy that until the end of that deal but i'll let phil put me right on this bit no, absolutely. I mean, uh, some lenders do have different policies where they want vacant possession, no, no matter what. But if, it, if it's a buy to let, then uh, most lenders will, will will be okay. But as, as, as I think as the article alludes to, the issue is is when you've got an investor selling to an occupier, and, and that's yeah. that, that's obviously an issue. But again. The art, reading the article in the intermediary, it seems to be the smaller landlord again. So I think that's where we're seeing that that behaviour of the smaller landlord. It, it's it's buy to let is less viable for your accidental smaller landlord. So it's all about the professionalism. So your professional landlords who know what they're doing a bit more, a bit more experienced, uh, they've probably got that economy of scale haven't they with with a with a portfolio as as, as well uh so that uh um you yeah, know we'll, yeah we're we'll seeing that and and again probably good to bring up the point about the rental reform bill there's there is a lot of fear from existing landlords about the consequences of the rental reform bill with the abolishment of the I think it's section 25. Uh, I'll have to listen back to last month's podcast. I, I, thought was, I thought it was section 21, or are they just... Yeah, sorry, yeah. I, I think you're right, Anna. Yeah, it's my, my, my bad there. But yeah, we had Perdit Baku from Black Solicitors as our guest mm. last month, and she summarised and gave a really fair and balanced view of the, 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 the Renters Reform Bill. And and she, you know, she 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 positioned it so well from the position of the landlord and the tenant, and you know, I I I read both sides of the argument beforehand, but she she framed it so well that actually it it, it does seem there is quite a lot of balance there 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 in that, but there's a lot of fear from landlords about the whether it's the section twenty one or twenty five um, that. Um, yeah, there's that fear. So, so they are um, they are exercising uh, that 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 um, that that right now, um, and, and, and 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 getting rid of, sort of tenants uh, sooner rather than later, which which is is another uh, which is obviously a, a bad consequence for for, for tenants. It's section twenty one. Section- yeah. My bad. Yeah. No, I just wrote a story on it this I didn't morning. Know. I've, so. ju- I've just yeah, thank you. It. <laughs> thank you for correcting me. Yeah. But it, isn't this obviously the the um isn't this where 
the Renting Homes Wales Act, which came into force in December last year, has addressed this already. This yeah. is this so is that's live in Wales already. Yeah. So that's, yeah. yeah. So it, you know, we we took the view with this because we were one of the we were one of the only lenders, I think, that actually varied our policy based on this Renting Homes Wales and the fact that it's not an AST. You need a whatever the wording is now, it's a standard contract, isn't it? It's called. Mm. So we've put that into our legislation because we knew this would probably come into England at some point. So we're kind of future-proofing ourselves. But to me, it makes absolute sense. I mean, you know, some of the stories around families, established families, you know, with me in that area with kids in the schools being, as you say, no fault evicted, because the decision to move before they can get things in plan, it, it kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. But I, just, you can see it from both sides, but it, it's, it's good to have that clarity. Just to, just to reinforce uh, Phil's plug, I'm going to do it one more time. So last month's podcast, there was a 10-minute section, I think it was nearly 10 minutes, about seven to eight minutes, where um, Pud went through the legislation, as Phil said, on both sides and uh, it addressed the balance. Because I think if you look in the mainstream media, and I'm not covering you here, but if you look in the mainstream media and the way it's positioned, it's anti-landlord. <laughs> um, if you look across the sort of more, more wider media, it is more sort of more balanced. Anna, your, any thoughts on that, on, on what you've seen on that and, and this story itself? Yeah, I mean, it is obviously, you know, nobody, you know, eviction is a really stressful, horrible thing to go through as a tenant. Um, Generation Rent just uh, issued an open letter today, which is why I was writing about Section 21 notices. So um, because oh. they're calling, they're <laughs> calling on, because um, they're calling on, um, they want to meet with mortgage lenders so that um, if the landlords get repossessed, um, what, you know, that the tenants are protected, because obviously if a property is repossessed and the tenants then get evicted, and then they're kind of saying, well, that's not really fair because it's the landlord, you know, the tenant's been paying their rent or, you know, it's the landlord's issue, not don't take it out on the tenant. So that's one, that's kind of an aspect that's just come out today. I, and there, with the kind of getting rid of Section 21 notices, I think there are two sides to it. And I know that the there has been some criticism of what would replace that. Is it just kind of like Section 21 by a different name? Will the new system work? is it fair to both parties so it's just very kind of there is a there's a better way you know i think the rent and reform bill is trying to kind of strike that balance but you yeah. will only really see we'll only kind of really see how it how you know and when it's actually enforced and how mm. well it works on the ground but i suppose with what tony said because they've already brought this in in wales so actually that could be a good case study to see actually is this working well is it working? can this can this kind of have read over yeah, for it's us it's it, yeah that just to end on um on the sort of landlords and 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 buy side but let's just talk about landlords for just a minute um as a as something that phil said earlier i think we we're quite keen to attack private landlords mm -hmm. but actually the most disturbing stories i've seen about landlords and the, and the the state of housing is actually social housing some of the councils that have been social housing i don't know if anybody follows i forget his name there's a, a young gentleman uh, he's from london uh, follow him on Twitter and have a look at the social housing issues. I think we've got a big issue. And if there, anyone from the government ever listens to this podcast, I doubt they do because we slay them all the time. And my word of advice to you is get your council in order and sort them out, stop attacking private landlords because actually the quality of private housing is much better than you get for social housing and build some. That's my little my little opinion That'll piece. Of yeah. I like social housing. I like my opinion. Um, yeah. But I it's think like, or, <laughs> it's like, or maybe don't sell off social house. Don't you know sell off council housing and exactly don't replace it. Exactly. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely no profit and no money for the council at all. They're selling it off a pit. Well, get rid of the I, 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 I was eight when they stopped building social housing. Wow. And I'm fifty two now. Wow. Wow. Well, that's that's when I. That's when our housing crisis started gonna, in I'm 1979. Gonna email, I'm going to email Michael Gove a link to this podcast and tell him to listen to the whole damn thing. In fact, 45 mm. minutes in, have a listen and just that, that's shocking when you say it like that and yeah. you think of it like that. And actually, we've had um, we got some stick in where I live in a, a very close to a town called Kingsley. We had a very 1970s block of flats and we had a, a designer come in to redesign the outside of them to bring them in line with the town centre. It's Bangham Town Centre. They look beautiful and they're still social housing. They didn't sell them on. Um, but I think, you know, as Anna was just saying, the um, and to bring it in, a lot of it was sort of bringing in these commercial entities, these social housing companies, as opposed to letting the councils run it. I think 
there's some reform needed there. If we're talking about reform, I think mm. that's reform we do need. And that will sort out the rental market and it could help the property market. So those are, those are my two pennies worth. Anyway, Thanks moving on. Uh, <laughs> 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 before I get on another run. Um, we're going to move away a little bit for a bite to let here and talk about um, this survey from Butterfield Mortgages. It was a mortgage introducer. It, um, they surveyed 2,000 UK adults to find out what mortgage customers are doing to count the effects of rising mortgage rates. Now, uh, it just I just found it a bit interesting. I thought we'd have a little pick at this because I thought it was, a, it was something different. Um, and this is obviously, we've already discussed, this is related to the base rate and obviously the fear and the, uh, and what we're going to do, what we're going to do. But it's quite interesting. Like Over a quarter of mortgage holders had made lump sum payments in the last 12 months. Um, uh, and then increasingly moving from like trackers to trackers and variables to fixed rates. Two thirds are still blaming last September's mini budget. We were talking earlier, and I was thinking the one thing we don't need this year is another mini budget in September. Um, but um, what are your thoughts on this across the the sector? And it, like, you know, is it is is people just really looking ahead and thinking, right, this is changing. What can I do to help myself? Mm-hmm. Isn't it? I think it's a part of it is the mortgage charter. Like, I don't think the mortgage charter kind of made a huge like it just kind of codified kind of like you know lenders were already doing a lot of this stuff so but it just kind of said kind of made it very clear to consumers this is what you can do so you know i think knowledge bank and uh legal and generals ignite both said oh we've had more interest in interest only switches like more interest people kind of looking at interest only and whether it will um lower payments Mm -hmm. um you know more people making slight overpayments if they can um that's another thing that i've been hearing um and pe- when people are kind of switch you know get people up, brokers have been telling me that, that people are getting in touch like six months beforehand like way more in advance than they used to because they're just like right okay i just want to fix in a deal at, you know and then i can just kind of fix in some deals and then just kind of have those irons in the fire and if pricing continues to go down at least i'm prepared at least i kind of know you know i'm trying to put myself in the best position and when it comes to fixed rates i know brokers have said people you know people tend to be opting for the shorter term fixed rates because people expect interest rates to go down in the next two years or so so then they can refix at a lower rate rather than fixing for five and then having to pay like a bigger early repayment charge to switch so those are the kinds of things that brokers are saying to me that they're seeing um but interesting about the mortgage charter measures i know that we hosted a mortgage solutions hosted a masterclass, and um some of the big and we had some of the big lenders kind of talking about oh what do we think of it and they're just like oh we're not really sure what the take-up is going to be like we're not really you know we wouldn't recommend these measures to everyone we just want the people to be aware mm. that they're there because once you've made some of those tweaks like switching to interest only or you know doing some of the other things you, you can only do that once so it's really a kind of only if you really need to but um it's a kind of i think but yeah, it's still quite tough because I don't think people can make the same economies that they used to because everything has gone up in price. So I think before it was like, oh, I'll just cancel my Skybox or I'll sc- cancel this. Whereas now it's just like, well, there's not really, it doesn't really feel like there's as many, there are still areas where you can save, but it's not, you know, it's not as, e- it doesn't seem as easy as, or I say not not that it was easy before, but it's, it does seem more challenging when um, when I'm speaking to brokers and when the, the interactions yeah. they're having with their customers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I got some concerns about the mortgage charter. I mm. think quite obviously a lot. There's a lot of good in there, but I, I'm I, I concern that particularly around extending the term and interest only is um, it, it's it's a very it's it's quite a dangerous thing because of once people switch to interest only, it's really hard to then change your habits and get back onto repayment. Uh, so that that is a concern for me. I mean, there are to, if, if, it's a, if, if it's a genuinely desperate situation where that is the alternative to, you know, being sort of repossessed or falling into arrears, then, yeah, absolutely. But my concern is, is um, a bit like during COVID with the mortgage payment holidays, there were some folks just taking it up because it was on offer. And, and and some of not not our financial press, financial media, but I'm concerned by some of the wider media has, has sort of picked it up as all oh, you can you know you can switch to interest only to to solve your problems and it, it's a really dangerous step uh, mm-hmm. and the concern with interest only is you always you just kicking the can down the road you have still got to pay that capital back and and that. That really concerns me as that it's a potential 
bad consumer outcome mm. and extending the term how much interest then extra are you paying on your mortgage to extend your term and that's that's another poor customer outcome yeah. that and, is... and that does concern me yeah, I was going to say it's you know interesting to kind of you know see you know with mm. the mortgage charter and consumer duty whether you know yeah. whether those two things are kind of whether they line up as they should. And I there's mean, a obviously... bit of a misalignment mm. there, I think. But uh, you know, um, yeah, I I've got concerns about that. I, I think the you know the, the the most important thing for consumers is they get good financial and mortgage advice. That that's the most mm. paramount <clears throat> critical thing. That, that yeah. you know, if somebody gets good advice uh, in front of a good mortgage advisor, then that will go a long way to, to sorting some, some of the some of the stuff out. You you made some really valid points there, Phil, that we've talked about a lot, and that's with the no offense, Alan, but we go mainstream media. Here. Mainstream media with people with writers who have absolutely no idea what they're writing about, what they're talking about, and giving awful advice. We had Tony Weir a good rant about this a, a few months back, didn't yeah. we? Giving really awful yeah. advice. Yeah. So for the broker audience here. This period and these changes and what's going on here with these with these consumers, as Phil just said, it's about giving the right advice and actually, you know, maybe pushing out a bit more messaging from the brokerage to the consumer and saying, don't make any rational decisions, come and speak to mm. us first. Mm. I think Absolutely. there's. I think there's also. But, a, sorry, there's also a concern because there's a no, bit in the mortgage charter where it says, "Oh, um, the customers can go straight, can go to their lenders and ask for a better rate or ask for better or like kind of." So what what does that you know if they're not then getting advice? And then the lender says, oh, why don't you just do this? Why don't you switch to yeah. Sony? Why don't you extend your term? They're not getting, they're, you know, they're not actually getting, a, you know, proper advice. So that's another element that I think maybe, you know, that's a worst yeah. case scenario. Mm. I, but equally, it is, you know, that's another thing that people have said that they're a bit kind of like, oh, that doesn't really, it's not very clear in the wording about how that will actually pan out, really. So... I don't know. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. It's um, again, it was smoke and mirrors, and it the whole thing really. Quite frankly, it's it's a sticking plaster to solve. Uh, you know, as I always say, um, <laughs> um, it's all about root cause analysis. And the example that I always use with my guys is, um, um, you've got um, a headache, and you're given an aspirin to solve it but actually the problem is you've got an axe sticking out the back of your head which the aspirin is not going to solve you need to remove the axe and solve that problem so this doesn't really do it does it but what i was going to say just a bit about getting advice and brokers um providing the right advice is advice is also not always saying what you want the customer the nice stuff it's about being brutally honest and saying guys you've got to take ownership of your financial future your lender will help you, but ultimately it's yours. So I think it's about brokers using all their experience to really manage the expectations of their clients at this at this crucial time. Mm. Very much so. Yeah, I totally agree. It's all about advice. Yeah, I'm glad it's well. Um, that was really interesting. I don't think I've got any more on that. And if anyone's got anything to say on it before I move on, nope. Um, okay, um, so that's out. And, and for the brokers in the audience, uh, anything we talk about, just Anna, just on your, you were talking about your masterclass earlier, I meant to stop you and ask yes. you, do you, is that available on an on-demand link? Uh, yeah, so it's on uh, Mortgage Solutions, there should be, it was, what was it called? <laughs> it, I think it was, um, it's really bad, I can't remember what it's called, but we've done, I did some write-ups on the webs on our website, and it's on our Amazing. YouTube channel as well, um, and it's, I think it's, we had Halifax, Santander, and HSBC um, talking about the state of the mortgage market. So it was actually, it was very interesting. I think I've got about three or four sto- three or four stories from it. So, you know, for me, it was great. <laughs> I will I will find one of your stories <laughs> and links to it. And um, I'll find the stories into it. And I'll put it into the description on our mm. podcast. So whatever channel you're listening on, I have a look in the description. I'll put a link in there for you. Because I like to link back to anything we've talked about. So I meant to say that earlier. Just one final story. Um, and... Uh, I, I wanted to bring this in, Tony, because you and uh, you, Phil and I spoke about this, and there was a couple of casualties in the market um, and a kind of sign of the times, I, I want to say, perhaps, in, in what's going on with, with finance. But um, there's been some popular, I would say, the, the large, is it, uh, I forget the name, it's the, la- the large mortgage loans company. Large mortgage loans. High net yeah. worth individuals has um, ceased trading, but also one of the friends of a podcast, uh, Jane Simpson, 
Um, yeah. And TBMC is also closing its mm. doors, which is really sad to to see. I mean, yeah. obviously Jane being a friend of the podcast as well. And if anybody is listening and could offer a Jane a job, or I've just got some ideas of where she might go, send it through to her. Because we've all been talking on her, her LinkedIn post to say, look, she's bloody brilliant. So somebody snap her up quick. Um, oh, but yeah, yeah she'll get snapped on that, up just, quick. You know, this, the, the, you know the, the economy is pretty stuffed. I mean, there aren't going to be casualties, but we hope it's not a long-term thing. But just any views on this and what, what you know, what we've seen? Well, is I think, I think it's, it's an interesting that the, the, the two firms in question are quite specialist in what they do, really. So that's the interesting thing is because we're, you know, we're currently looking at going, do, do, brokers specialize in one area anymore or are they more generalist and I think to me it's more the latter and these are two examples where specialism hasn't turned out in the right way I mean TBMC have been trading for a long time and but obviously going through the challenges of the buy to let market recently if there's not enough volume going through to generate the profitability they need you know I don't know the reasons for the closure but obviously I suppose businesses making loads of money don't tend to close. Mm -hmm. So um, I can uh, make in my own assumption there. Sorry, Jane, if that's not the case. Um, so I think it's just a sign that um, it's trying to specialize or um, is, is, is a challenge in this, in this environment. And we see it actually, Phil, don't we? Um, interestingly, with self-build, just slightly going off topic, mm -hmm. a lot of brokers coming to us because obviously self-build is a passion of ours going so you do self-build i've heard a bit about it we want to do some how do we get involved so there's a lot of brokers now going into markets that they would have typically ignored because there was no requirement to tie themselves in their view with that extra knowledge needed they're now rethinking that and i think it's probably an example of of that i know phil will have his own views on this as just, just well on, just on what tony just said but it's what we've always encouraged isn't it on all these specialists every time we do a specialist podcast or webinar we're encouraging brokers who don't specialize in there to go have a dip into this have a look at it because you know it could bring you money could bring you in business so you know it's very true phil sorry your thoughts yeah yeah i think um so i echo what tony says i think i think diversification is good i mean specialism is good but you need to be diverse. It's, it's having that diversification as well. So you, you, you're not putting all, all your eggs in one basket in, 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 a, in a specific sector. You've got other other areas to sort of focus and get business from. So it, it, it's, I think it's really important for, for obviously brokers to cover as many bases as they can. So they, they're not turning business away that they, they don't readily deal with. So it's either having an introducer arrangement to, so they can get something from it or or maybe align themselves or, or work with specialist packagers who uh who can help them place the more uh tricky cases that they they may not readily easily you know uh place every day uh but but yeah just 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 really echo yeah. everything Tony said um firstly what well, an apologies i've just realized that it was your article so <laughs> you, you, you can you can actually answer this far more than me but one of the things i was going to say and it was linking back to i think last last month's uh webinar um sorry if everybody can hear my dog barking i apologize for that uh, in the background um was what does your website say about how you can help clients? And does it really focus on the clients you want to attract? Because interesting, one of my BDMs was commenting the other day that he's seen a number of websites saying they do this stuff and they don't, mm -hmm. but it's almost clickbait. It's SEO, mm -hmm. SEO clicking, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so it's. I think that's a key thing. If you are a specialist, be really clear that you're attracting that kind of client and make it really clear to speaking all that stuff we've done around self-employed and the fact that 50% don't even think they can get a mortgage. Well, actually, if we know they can make it really clear that they can yeah. as an example. Um, sorry, just Anna, one coming to you, just, I've got a specific question for you and then uh, we are, we are gradually running out of time, but just a quick question to you. Um, and that is, is there any more that we haven't seen? Obviously we've picked these two out because mm -hmm. they, we, we know people and directly with other people. Have you heard news of other, specialists or smaller companies yeah. that are so so because i wrote that large mortgage loan story because a broker just um sent me a message just being like oh there it says 
it has this note on their website that it says that they've ceased trading and then obviously chase that up and tbmc is obviously it was obviously really it's really sad because we also you know um jane simpson also does a lot of stuff with mortgage solutions so um yeah, but I think there will probably there might be some smaller broker firms, and like um, Tony and Phil have said, that are more specialists that might be struggling, just because if you are kind of focusing on a few small few smaller markets, if there there's then hiccups in the market or people or borrowers are then more cautious, you're then kind you're just a bit stuck, I think. Um, but I haven't heard of any more, and I wouldn't. And but I do also think brokers are becoming even more important because everything's so uncertain and people will go to brokers more but i think it there might unfortunately be some more casualties just because the market is more uncertain but it can you can turn that into a positive i think in the sense of like proactively reaching out to customers and kind of diversifying and kind of trying to you know spread you know trying to kind of spread yourself out a little bit more yeah. As as a marketer yeah, and- on the flip of what to- sorry Tony marks on the flip of what Tony said is make sure you've got what you do do on your website because mm-hmm. I str- I find it very difficult to find people because they don't say well actually we do this area and actually just having a look at what you do and how you openly communicate you know these customers are going to be homeless now potentially or they'll be looking for somewhere else this is your chance to pick it up I guess the audience here listening in now you'd sitting in a brokerage this is your chance to pick those up sorry Tony I'll talk yeah to you. no I was just going to say it's a plea to brokers that you know they're Whatever your scenario for your client, there is a lender out there, all right? It might not be at a rate that you think is appropriate, but there will be a lender out there. So what I would say is reach out and speak to the BDMs. You know, all our guys are there to help. We're, as Phil says, we are, we are solution providers. That's what we do. Come to us. The beauty of our lending is it's, it's all underwritten by human being, and we can help get deals together to make sense. So I would just say reach out if you don't know lenders like ourselves or, and there's, you know, lots of lenders like ourselves that are in that flexible mindset, do speak to us. Yeah, you know, I have a, a peer WhatsApp group of specialist lenders and peer building societies. And we, you know, the stuff that we can't do, we share with each other and say anyone else can sort of help. So, yeah, if, 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 if you come to one of our, our, our peer members, we'll... If we can't do it, we'll try and find somewhere else for for we a home for it. So uh, yeah, yeah, reach out to your BDMs is uh, is always key for my key message for for, for brokers. Uh, it's amazing what you'll learn from them. What a great way to end the podcast, eh? Uh, that's a really nice ending. So at that, we have run out of time. So I just want to say a massive thank you, Anna. Thank you again for joining us. As always, thank so you. knowledgeable and really good to have you on. And Absolute come back pleasure. soon. Brilliant. Thanks, Anna. Thanks. And thanks to Phil and Tony, the stalwarts of SFI Not So Live. So thank you to you guys too. <laughs> um, we've also got the visual version of me and Tony back again uh, on the 12th of September. So we are doing a contract to mortgage special. And we're introducing you to a telephone BDM, Lizzie. Lizzie Clack is joining us. Uh, first time ever we'll see Lizzie. So we're looking forward to that. That's coming up on the 12th of September. It's a LinkedIn Live. So pop over to um, LinkedIn and just have a look at the events on the Saffron for Interviews page. So LinkedIn Live, so you can watch it live on your LinkedIn. You haven't got anywhere else. And any comments you tell us come up on the screen. It's all very technical and very beautiful. Uh, so that's going on the 12th September. Um, so join us for that. And all our other podcasts available wherever you listen to your podcast. So that's it from us for what is September's podcast. And we'll see you again in October. See you later, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.